Hello and welcome to the WSB's podcast summary of the June WSB meeting. I'm Sean Steenkamp, a Assistant Project Manager here at the WSB, and with me today to discuss the key outcomes is Nicole Giles, the Technical Director of the WSB. As you would expect, we have our usual disclaimer that today's podcast provides personal views of the presenter and does not necessarily represent the views of the WSB or other WSB staff. It is for general information only and shouldn't be considered to be advice. So Nicole, June was a key meeting, progressing two key projects, income of not-for-profit entities and service concession arrangements. Yes, Sean. A significant amount of time was spent finalising some of the key remaining issues. Both projects are on track for publication later this year. In not-for-profit income in particular must be finalised as this is one of the few standards we know entities may want to early adopt. To highlight the key points, let's begin with income for not-for-profits. Some significant transition relief is being provided. Yes, Sean. The Board has listened to the exposure draft feedback and decided that comparatives need not be restated in the first year. This effectively means an extra year to implement, so it won't be applicable until 2019. This will make it harder for users to see the impact of any changes, but there will be a change in accounting policy note to help. The Board also discussed specific transition relief relating to peppercorn leases, didn't they? Yes, the Board is aware that peppercorn leases, where you pay well below market value lease payments, are often not being accounted for currently. Having to recognise lease assets at fair value, consistent with other assets received by a not-for-profit entity, will be a challenge, given many of these leases are for 99 years. To help with this, the lease asset will only need to be fair valued at the beginning of the period first adopted, not at the beginning of the lease. So recent market transactions may be available to make the valuation easier. It's also important to note that not everything labelled a lease will be accounted for as a lease. And any where there are restrictions on usage will need to be included in the valuation. The Board also made decisions relating to perpetual endowments and capital grants. What impact will these have? For perpetual endowments, the Board will clarify that a grantee will usually end up with an asset it controls, either the underlying cash or the right to future income in perpetuity, uh, with generally the same value being recognised. Revenue will be recognised depending on whether any performance obligations apply to the asset recognised itself. If the asset is cash and the obligation is to invest the principal in perpetuity and there is little restriction on how to use the income, then it's likely that the revenue will be recognised when the cash has been invested and additional guidance and examples will be provided. And for capital grants, the Board decided to take a practical approach to help simplify the standard? Yes, Sean. The Board agreed that where grants of cash that must be used to acquire or construct a non-financial asset to specifications and also have a return obligation, and in substance it's a grant of a non-financial asset, there is a performance obligation and no revenue is recognised until the obligations are satisfied, so for example as the asset is being constructed. Most people instinctively think this is the right answer, but technically the Board found it very hard to fit this into AASB 15 revenue. So to make it simple, this will be clearly stated in the new standard. Thank you. So what are the next steps on the project? The board will look to the final issues and the draft standard at the August meeting, and we are still looking for input to make sure it will be simple and easy to use. So please get in touch if you'd like to be involved in this. Thank you. Moving on to another important domestic project, service concession arrangements, the key decisions were who the standard will apply to and how to account for arrangements where the operator is paid by the grantor based on the usage of the asset. Yes, Sean. The board confirmed that all public sector entities will apply the standard, both for-profit and not-for-profit. The consequence is that it is highly unlikely for a for-profit entity granting the operator the right to charge customers will be able to claim compliance with IFRS. The Board agreed with feedback indicating that public sector consistency was more important than non-compliance with IFRS for for for-profit entities. For arrangements where the operator is paid by the grantor based on customer usage, the Board decided these should be accounted for using the financial liability method, and this this may mean the operator and the grantor account for the arrangement differently. 
However, the board decided that accounting for the substance of the arrangement was more important. Thank you, Nicole. The board also discussed the ISB insurance standard expected later this year. What are the key issues? Well, in Australia, we have been ahead of the curve in insurance accounting. The ISB standard will significantly improve current accounting by international insurers and reduce the competitive disadvantages that our insurers face. The AISB has had some success in influencing the proposals, although there are still some areas we think that can be improved. The AISB is going to do a webinar on the key changes from current requirements. And the key changes will be that the accounting will now depend on the contract terms and not whether it's a life or a general insurance contract. Many life insurance contracts with a new annual renewal of terms will be able to use a simplified accounting approach, similar to that used by general insurers now. Another key change will be deferred acquisition costs are less likely to be capitalised. Some entities may find difficulties with having to track the inception date discount rate and may find that they are recognising more day one expected losses. The AISB will also be doing more work to see how these proposals should apply to the public sector. And do we know when the ISB is expected to release the standard? Uh, yes, Sean, we're expecting it to be released by the end of the year. Thank you, Nicole. And in terms of the RDR project, the board finalised its draft joint Australian and New Zealand policy statement for determining RDR for Tier 2 entities. How is that project tracking in terms of timing for the exposure draft? Uh, thanks, Sean. The staff are working on finalising the review of the last few standards for inclusion in the exposure draft so that it's ready for the board to consider in the next few months. We are, help we are hopeful that this work will be completed in time for the August meeting, but there may be some need to move this date back slightly. The project does form part of the broader financial reporting framework project and is part of the post-implementation review of RDR, so it is an important project to the AISB. Indeed it is. And the last topic I wanted to cover today was the AISB Agenda Consultation Project. We gave a brief update to the board at this meeting to highlight some of the key feedback received to date. Yes, thank you to everyone who has provided feedback today. It is encouraging to hear that our current work program has support including the Financial Reporting Framework project. And for future projects, demand is for improving AISB 13, fair value measurement, um, particularly for guidance in the not-for-profit sector, both in terms of application issues and disclosure. Uh, we also have support for more work to assist implementation by uh, SME entities, including guidance and education. Uh, Post-implementation reviews for certain public sector specific requirements, including AISB 1055 budgetary reporting. And in terms of the AISB undertaking further external reporting projects, we are hearing some support for the AISB to assist Treasury to improve remuneration reporting. It's also important to note that what we're not hearing is that anything is fundamentally broken. Well, that's good to hear. We'll bring back to the August board meeting a complete summary of feedback for the board to consider, including recommendations for project proposals. And finally, looking forward to the next board meeting, the board plans to continue its focus on finalising the key domestic projects, most importantly income for not-for-profits. Yes, Sean, and as always, we encourage as many of you as possible to get in touch with us on projects you are interested in, and we're always very happy to receive feedback. Thank you very much, Nicole. So in summary, key projects are on track for finalising this year, and August will be a key meeting for, for, for looking forward into the 2017-2019 WSB Work Programme. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you have any questions, please get in touch with either of us.